Hello, and welcome to episode 14. I'm coming to you a little after I just recorded that, the episode, but I wanted to say something. The song that you're hearing underneath what I'm saying right now, as well as the theme song, Journal Entries by Ann Davis, have this, uh, this Christian theme to them, especially the one that I'm playing right now, Where to Find You by Watermark, I used to love to listen to in my funny days. And it's interesting that I, I'm remembering and, you know, finding them. Whereas, like, journal entries, um, I found it, I liked part of it, it really fit for this theme song, and then it goes into this next part is a biblical reference about, you know, the high, you know, I, I can go up to the mountain or to the big out bottom of the ocean and you would find me. And, and I was thinking about this song that I'm playing right now and that I don't necessarily see them the way I used to when I was a fundy, but I still find truth in them. And something I've been thinking about in my other aspects of life and in this study recently with we're reading about my camp experience, my camp friends that there's this aspect in friendship in people that you love that you connect with on this deep soul level that despite how far apart you go whether it be distance or time or both you can always find each other and you can always come back together again and still have that spark that you had when you met and that to me is an aspect of divine love it's what people are looking for when they look into religion or spiritual, they're looking to love, love that kind of completes them. First of all, you have to find completion in yourself. Yes, of course. But once you have that, there is always that friendship. And sometimes in the aspect, in the in before you can ever complete yourself for yourself, there are these friends, these people that are that aspect of divine love that have helped you find yourself. And I have many friends like that in all facets of my life, from high school, neighborhood friends, college friends, whatever it is, theater friends, but this episode, these last two episodes and this episode right now, I want to dedicate it to my camp friends. And you know, there was a lot of them that, you know, I remember going through the years with and graduating and talking to a little bit after that, but they fell away. But there were certain ones that I never lost touch with. Even if we would go time and distance without seeing each other, without talking to each other, we knew how to get a hold of the other one. We knew how to find them. And that's why I'm playing this song. It's called Where to Find Me. So the thing about camp is it was it was that precursor, as I was saying as I say like er, later on in this episode, I talk about how I was always kind of on the search for the divine. That's why I, when I left the church, I left fundamentalist fundamentalism, I was able to, to have peace and still believe in something because, because I was always on this quest. That was just one of my searches was fundamentalism and I could appreciate certain aspects of it. But I think that it began at camp. It began at camp because here was a place that I went to. I did not know these people, but they loved me. They loved me merely because I was occupying a space in the same space that they were on this planet at this time. And together we loved each other without n having to know anything about each other. We just loved each other and we served together to make the world a better place. And isn't that really what you are craving when you are looking for something of the divine. So I dedicate this episode to my camp besties, Seuss, Tonka, Toast, Wembley, and Tara. Thank you for always knowing where to find me and I you. I love you. Pages of my old journals with every turn another memory 
and dusty words bring pictures to my mind I see the marks of the passage of time hello welcome to the what was it the 14th episode of journaling through the years I'm kind of losing count um, but I'm having a lot of fun. I hope that whoever is watching this is gleaning something from my writings from my youth. Uh, we're going to be still going through this journal today. It's falling apart. So, or things are falling out. I should just pull all this stuff out for now. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, a cozy rainy day today, um, raining in and out, gray skies, you know, I love that kind of weather, and it's so nice to be inside, you know, with a cup of coffee, and outside it's kind of gray, skies are gray, it always gives me such a creative feeling, and I've always loved it, and felt such comfort in this kind of weather, and, um, I'm going through some chronic sickness issue and hopefully I can start to get the bottom of that. I see a uh, talk to my doctor tomorrow afternoon so I'll keep you posted but I've been sick on and off I think all my life but I really noticed it this year that it's like almost every month I get the same kind of symptoms and I'm sick for like a week a weekend or sometimes longer. This has been I was sick last week I was a little bit sicker um, uh, than I am kind of incapable of doing things and then and I thought well I'll rest it'll get better in a few days and I got better on Saturday I was able to do a bunch of stuff around the house and that was really cool I just like so much got done but then Sunday I woke up and I was just like I got up I slept until nine which is insane and then even on the weekend and then I got up and I was trying to do things and I ended up going back to bed until like one and then was still kind of dreary and kind of ugh. But I ended up getting, you know, being productive anyway, so it's all in life. I am going to be writing a blog about what it means to, the feeling, the lessons I can learn from being uh, chronically illness. So that my blog is artistthriving.blogspot.com at present. Um, so check it out if you have a chance, if you haven't already. And then the other thing that's been going on is I live in the country in a very older uh, mobile home and it's a fixer-upper as I like to joke and I have we've had a squirrel infestation squirrels are trying to take over the house and so I've had to be battling that and so it's very frustrating and I'm like yelling at the walls get out of my house get out of my house and, and, you know, cleaning things out and finding areas where they're coming in and putting a boulder on there. And I have musophobia, which is a fear of mice or small creatures. And so it's like facing my fears big time to try to get this taken care of. Um, but, you know, you think about the idea of, um, uh, like, n spirit animals. I always like to think about that when there's a creature that is... Like, there's some animal that is so prevalent in your life. Like, for me, all my life, I've really liked pigs, and I've really loved, and I have a cat. I love cats, and so I really always had a, a great love for pigs, and then at the same time, I, my, in the last couple of years, since I started the production company, my pet, my pet raccoon, my, my raccoon puppet from childhood has taken over and been kind of, like, a resurgence of his life and he's become the mascot and so then even before that I was doing a play where one of the big monologues was about raccoons and so it's like I've had this kind of uh, connection to raccoons and and so there's some spirit animal to kind of look into that and I've always noticed whenever like would we be going to set or we'd be going anywhere we'd see like if we were on set, we'd see like a hawk and we'd be like, oh my gosh, it's kind of what can it be t teaching us? So even in this, it's kind of cool for me that even in this um, stressful, annoying situation with these squirrels, it's like, what, what am I trying to be taught here from these squirrels? I did notice my partner said something about 
uh, gathering that they're gather. You know, they gather for the winter and they prepare. So there's some maybe something in there. I haven't really. I'm still figuring out. But it's nice that in my recovery and in my growth in life, I can. I can see that. It's, it's nice to see that even even in this stressful situation, I'm not just looking at it as this annoyance. I'm turning around going, okay, what's a positive here? What am I trying to be taught? That's really cool. Um, it shows a lot of growth that I've been really working on myself in the last two years and taking this time of COVID to do that. So anyways, if you have any uh, thoughts about that so far, please comment below about what a squirrel, you know, squirrel might mean in the spirit animal world and uh, or any other insights you have. So just one reminder that Journaling Through the Years is the series on this channel where I read uh, excerpts from my journal from way back in the day and all the way until, well, I've got them. I'm still writing. So, and I've never read them. I, it's been years since I've read them. And it's really been interesting because I remember a lot of them, a lot of stuff, and I remember where I was. Specifically, the one I'm going to start with, I remember I really like this one. It really, it felt like really, really good. So, sip of coffee and let's begin. Silence. Silence. Listen to the sounds all around. The gentle breaths of those around you. Fear creeps over you. Why so silent? You reach out for help, but no sound falls from your lips. You wish to crawl in bed with a warm companion, but you still don't move. Your thoughts trap you. You can't run from yourself. What do you think about? Thoughts fly freely. Do they scare you? Thoughts run wildly, flashing quickly through your mind like a bee buzzing from bud to bud, fish flitting through the shadowy water. I love that. Like a bee buzzing from bud to bud, fish flitting through the shadowy water. Such a, because I, I lived on a lake growing up and you could look down and just that description, the shadowy water, you could see the shadow where the trees fell over or kind of the you know, the shadow of the trees and how it affects, and then you can see the, the fish, the little minnows probably darting in and out and doing their thing. And it's really interesting to, um, to think about this because there is a two-parter here. On one level, I think the first level, I was always very insightful. I am a very insightful person and being an empath, I believe I'm an empath and more of the sentient, you know, emotional, mental kind of sense of knowing is one of my gifts as an empath. And so I've always had this ability to see beyond what a person shows on the outside. And it's gotten me in trouble because I'll go to somebody and be like, you, this and this and this and this. And they'll be like, no, that's not true. And I'm like, but I know it's true. And uh, it is, or to some degree, they're just not ready to face it. Now, as I've grown up, I've been like, okay, I don't have to save you. I can know that, but I don't, I don't, you've got your journey. I don't have to be the savior. Um, so I see this as the sense of like, you know, people around me, probably in my class and my school were, um, trying to distract from them, from their own thoughts as we do, you know, as kids and in the society, we try to, uh, not think about, what's going on or these deep thoughts. We just, you know, we just have to get through the day. Uh, and I, I couldn't necessarily do that. I think, I don't think we all can. So do they scare, scare you thoughts running wildly, flashing quickly through your mind? And so is that sense of that? I also know that one of the gifts that has saved me when I left the church, the Christian, the fundamentalist Christian church, is that way before that, I was, even in this time period, I was a, dabbling with Wiccan and, and that, and really interested in that. And I was also reading uh, books, uh, kind of studying Buddhism and trying to understand that. So I never really became a Buddhist, and at the time I wouldn't really claim myself to be Wiccan and into astrology, but I was studying it and I found it interesting. But I think that 
I think that that going forward through the fundamentalist religion and being uh, disenchanted with that and then leaving and having to be de dis deconstructing that reality and, and realizing the, the false falsity, falseness of that. Um, I think that I learned, I, I think that when I left the church, I had already had this kind of foundation of I believe something. And so as I de deconstructed, I was able to see the value in being in that fundamentalist Christian world, see the value in that understanding of the spirit world. I did not, like a lot of my friends that I've talked to, that I've become close to during my deconstruction, have become more atheist or agnostic. And I haven't gone that way because I look at religion, whether it's corrupt or not, as the sense that we're, there's a reason that there are all these sense of all these religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, and they're all kind of saying the similar things, whether the Christians or the Muslims want to admit it or whatever, they're all saying very similar things. They're all using similar rhetoric. For me, that doesn't go to that it's all lies. For me, it strikes the chord of there must be some truth. There must be some craving of us to have, want to have a meaning, a want to understand. And then maybe that's the purpose of life is that we're wanting to uh, figure out why we're here and what our purpose is and why, 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 and, and the sense of evolution. And so then I kind of fall back to more of the Wiccan recently. I call myself the born again Wiccan because I once called myself a born again Christian or a born again virgin way back when. So now I'm a born again Wiccan. It's, it's kind of fun and it, it's reclaiming. And with that, I don't, I haven't like connected to any covens or anything, or haven't even done as much research as I would like to, because I'm researching other things, um, and, and diving into them, but it's just a kind of a, admiration for nature and, and, and the peace that comes from just, you know, working in my garden or being with my cat or just being outside or going for a dog walk. It's, it's just, it's like, I have this awe and respect in that way. And that got totally off track. <laughs> so that, that, that's that level, that first level, but then the second level and the thoughts running wildly, and we're going to see it a lot moving forward is this sense in me at the time and in especially in recent years well not in the last two years but yeah and even the last two years even though i'm working on it now is this sense of i was not i would i myself was afraid to sit still i myself was battling with racing thoughts and anxiety and i didn't necessarily have a word for it and i didn't think that it may all my life, I thought, isn't this how everybody is? Doesn't everybody have this? You know, a lot of people do, but, you know, also they don't. <laughs> they have, you know, there are lots of people in the world with mental illness and PTSD, but there are also people that were raised, uh, don't have those disabilities. They have is other issues, but they don't, you know, what's going and even in sense even those people that have mental illnesses have a different different all our brains are different so yes we have the dsm it's like this this defines this and this defines this we have uh, medical books that say this is this illness and this falls into this but they're always varied by person to person so you can go so like for me they always thought, well, you have bipolar and you have borderline at one point. Well, that borderline went away. And then when I first started looking at my PTSD within recent years and looking at PTSD and bipolar side by side, I'm like, I could see why they would think I would have uh, BPD or borderline personality disorder. Whoa, going way off track. So that just, that's that. We're going to move on. I love you. The sky is filled with an unending blue. The trees reach so high, they almost scrape the sky. Stories lie the path. No, stones lie the path of a dry river. Water rushes down in my imagination. The stump I rest upon by the old river. Chattering voices behind me mingle with the wind until I'm alone in a vast world. We are together, yet I've separated myself. 
My life reveals itself to me, yet it is hidden. So I am unsure and confused of the path I shall take. Choices I have to make. The world is wide. Opportunities are ready to happen. Friends I haven't come acquainted with yet surround me. I try not to lose the ones I got. I stand tall and proud. Yet on the inside I shrivel inside. Afraid of pain, I step down from my spot. Find myself running to the warmth and memory of those I love. I remember why I think I was... This is strange because I feel like a lot of this is... This, a lot of this might have been written at camp, but I feel like a lot of it has been written either a previous, like looking back at camp, and so it might have been a previous year because I feel like I remember where I was specifically when I was writing this and what happened on that day. Can I must see it? And I can, I can hear the people behind me. This was a silt day off, a camper and leisure training day off. And we went to Richardson Grove for the night. We, we'd gone other places. We had gone to Garberville, Garberville, California, the famous Garberville, California. We'd go there on our days off from camp and we'd wander around and like, it was like, Oh, freedom. And we do laundry and all that stuff. And it was great. It was just great memories. Um, I remember it was great memories and, and I, a couple years ago, I actually drove through there and stopped there, uh, on my way back from my parents' house with my partner. And it was interesting to see, to see after however many years, 20 some years at the time, how different, it, how things had changed, but not very much. And I remember walking through and I was wearing these um, Converse that had a, a, the 11th Doctor on them. And I was wearing a backpack, a little, it was a TARDIS backpack, but I was like walking around with my partner and we went to a restaurant that we frequented when I was a kid and this and that. And uh, when I was about 15 and I remember walking around and I suddenly felt like I was my 15 year old self. I was wearing the backpack and the Converse and I was just like, I just felt like that as I'm walking around. It felt really, really wonderful. Um, so I remember I was sitting on this tree stump and I think that another counselor, I don't know why this counselor was there, but I even have the picture of him because there was Seuss, uh, I was just gonna say her camp name, was our like director of the silts. Like she was the, the, she supervised us. But there was this other guy there or that he came by maybe he dropped us off snoopy and he god these were 20 somethings and i remember just thinking they were so grown up and i was like 15 and now we're all grown up we're all above 18 we're all in our 30s and 40s and you know <laughs> we probably look at them now and they're just like the same age but at the time they were so grown up they were man and woman and whatever and i remember snoopy was sitting on this tree stump and myself and my two bestie camp friends i just have such a fondness for them um and a warmth in my heart uh toast and tara should have another name um i won't say her last name so anyways there's a picture of at least the two of them and maybe i'm in that picture with them and then i think there's another one with me sitting there and then them sitting in front of me and it just looking back like those two and another one wembley are the ones that stand out and have kind of stood the test of time and just had a very close connection even if i even if i was still so guarded with myself i feel like they were people i trusted and they were people that i could intuitively connect with and vice versa and that is so i call them my camp besties even this time even though we haven't seen each other in years and years and had very loose contact whether it's like social media or a birthday card or something that's their that's their specialty in in life and connection to me my camp besties so <laughs> really all over the place. So yeah, this was written on that moment. And I find it interesting that even though I'm at camp and I'm really grateful for camp, because I think that in a lot of my life moving forward, my hardships, uh, with the abuse of marriage, with the church, there was this inner sense of knowing what was right, what love was right, 
what was what was striving for, what I was looking for, and all these things that became painful and disastrous. And a huge part of that was going to camp and having that connection with people that loved me without question, loved me because I just showed up to camp. And that is something I'm grateful for. And so I'm, but I'm still questioning, you know, I'm unsure and confused of the path I shall take, choices I have to make, the world is wide. I mean, a lot of that is what a 15, a 16 year old would, you know, you're going into high school and you're in high school and you're going to th start thinking about college or what's going to happen, happen after high school. And there's all so many questions. I mean, in middle school and younger high school, you're going through this like change of your body and your hormones and you get kind of past that. In high school, you start thinking a little wider, a little like you look out to the world and at one point you think, yes, I'm going to conquer the world. And then another part of you is like a kind of uncertain and afraid. So I feel like that's what's going on. And I also see I uh, friends I haven't come acquainted with yet surround me. There was probably a few people in there. You know, when you go to camp, when I was going to camp, it was three summers in high school, two weeks at a time. And then we might see each other for certain weekend retreats throughout the year or weekend parties or this and that. And But you didn't see each other day to day, so you didn't have like a every day I know exactly like I just get you because I see you every day I know how you're gonna react I didn't but so I didn't had to come acquainted or there might have been like I said my camp besties were with me but there was probably another group of people that I was getting close to in that week um, I try not to lose the ones I got I stand tall and proud is the sense of fear of I'm gonna lose them so I better I better like keep them somehow whatever and I'm shriveling inside I'm afraid I've got pain so you see this a lot this sense of that pain and then in that fear though what's really comforting is the way it ends as I step down from my spot and I find myself running to the warmth of, and memory of those I love so I'm running back to them so this could have been written after that but I feel like I was sitting on this step on this stoop this tree stump and and looking out at the dry riverbed and they were behind me and I was writing it and then I got off and then somewhere in there I took a picture maybe I took the picture first and then then I went and sat there because I was like Snoopy, that's a good spot so the next part this is a little funnier it's um I'm never good at this it's a skit it says skit all my campers talk show or soap opera and so it looks like something we were going to do for campfire where we were going to do a uh um like some kind of a uh for campfire we're going to do some kind of soap opera and call it all my campers and the ideas that we'd come up with this is not my writing i don't know who this is but she was probably i think it's a girl she was i i remember it to be some girl she was probably um like secretary as we we're throwing out ideas so we have ideas fire in one of the cabins silt or counselor dies but later comes back from the dead do, do, do. camper may be sneaking illegal candy into the cabins those who went to raggers never came back and are lost in the woods i really like how she wrote and like a ampersand right can you see that like that um raggers <laughs> raggers it was completely normal what was raggers oh i'll tell you what raggers was raggers i think i talked about it in the last one it was completely not creepy and completely not a cult really i say that in all facetiousness <laughs> no it really wasn't but it can look like that okay so there was these rags and if you've been to my house and you've been to my office or you've lived with me or or anything you've probably seen them in some capacity in my room they're they're looking at them right above my computer right now there was a blue one a brown one and a red one and then there was more but i only got those and the blue run was the first one i ever got when i was a camper and it was uh for loyalty and I remember I swore that I was going to stop lying because a lot of my life I spent making up stories about my life that weren't true. Like I, I, I was making these stories up constantly about my life and telling them 
and they weren't true. They were lies. They, that was not a reality. But it was, a, I think it was a sense, it was another way for me to escape from what, where, from the circumstances that I was in that seemed better and happier. So we got the blue rug. Then we had the brown rug, which was about community and community. I didn't really understand that at the time, how to take that. I remember they said the brown rag is the ugliest rag, and I think it had to do with the fact that community, serving the community is is a thankless job. Then there was the red rag, which I I really like the most, uh, was leadership. And you would have to pledge to do this. You'd have to get a, a partner and somehow in that week that you were at camp, and you would talk to them, and you had this little cards, and I think I have them somewhere. Um, and they had like little poems and little things you had to sort of read through, you don't have to memorize them. And then late at night, and it would get later and later as you went. So it'd start like around nine when it started to get dark or maybe nine 30 or 10 and you'd go out <laughs> and you'd have to be blindfolded and you'd have your, your person you'd chosen and they would take you to these certain points and you'd have a person at each stand and you would, they would read this to you with a flashlight and you'd have to repeat it back and you go to each one and then you'd finally end up <laughs> in this circle with like a try it was like it was it was like a and there was candles like a circle with the candles and then there was like a, a square with candles and then a triangle and you couldn't you if you just got the blue rag you had to be on the outer limits and you <laughs> you had to sit on a left knee and then when you did the uh brown rag you could switch to the right knee and then when you got the red rag you could sit with both knees and you got to move closer and closer inward each time and you had this moment where you could undo the thing and everybody was sitting around. It was not a cold, not creepy at all. <laughs> Sounds like it. So uh, that's what Raggers was. Those who went to Raggers never came back and are lost in the woods. You know, this is before Blair Witch. So maybe that's why I was so afraid of Blair Witch. I was like, oh. Uh, mixed up romances between counselors. She didn't know how to spell counselors. She spelled it C-O-U-N-S. L-E-R-S. Maybe. One plotting to ruin a relationship. A triangle of love. A lost love comes back to camp. Oh. <laughs> Silts never came back from their day off. <laughs> they just left. <laughs> Counselors plotting to take over the director's position. Counselor plotting to sell camp to the chocolate factory. What? What is the chocolate factory? Okay, it was like an oil plant that was right next to camp. Like here's camp and it was like on a cliff, kind of, it was like on a mountainside and you'd have to like walk up to the cabins and then there's the upper plain field, which is the upper plain field, just the plain field where you could play games and things. And then beyond that was the forest and that was where like the raggers Creed and you could go camping and stuff on your, you know, you'd have overnights with your cabin. And um, Right next to it was this like oil field or not oil field, like a factory and it was oil and you know, it was like a lake of oil right there. <laughs> and it was, we called it the chocolate factory because the oil looked like ch chocolate. So yeah. And then it says your ideas. I just thought it was funny. Then there is the Scooby-Doo skit. There was a Scooby. So saved by a silt commercials camper class director counselor i guess to be for that and then the address and then silts uh i guess we're deciding that there was going to be shaggy thelma scooby fred delma and then we say mr smith who runs the nacho mama restaurant in garberville disguised as snoopy snoopy if you remember was one of the uh counselors so i guess we were saying that maybe snoopy the guy the counselor who was named snoopy was really Mr. Smith or something. And Nacho Mama was that restaurant I went a few years back when I was walking through with the Converse with Matt Smith on them and my backpack, the TARDIS backpack. And I was like, oh, I feel like I'm 15. Nacho Mama. Nacho Mama. And of course they were Mexican. A Mexican restaurant. Not they, but the restaurant was Mexican. Kind of like a little stand with a little back porch area. And <sighs> going in there, I was like, oh, I remember. Okay. This seems like it was written after camp, like 
in school and I was probably sitting in class supposed to be listening and taking notes and I was writing a poem and not even paying attention the teacher was like hello do you have something oh uh no we are scattered about now like the ripples of the water when a stone is tossed upon them far apart from each other I know that it has to be this way in order to survive we need to move around change our habitat still it hurts and I long for your golden beauty your rosy cheeks deep blue eyes Still, I'm glad that we were together for the time we had. We were meant to be together. We did what we had to do, came together and formed a chain, a link to our future. Now the rock has been thrown into the calm waters. We are scattered apart. I sit by myself in a room with bare walls, waiting for something to happen, thinking of you as the moments fly by. We had to move on, yet my heart slowly breaks. Piece after piece crumble away, dripping down to the pit of my stomach. A tear trickles down, trickles from my eye. Okay, so um, a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old grappling with time and that things end, that's really kind of an interesting thing to look at um it looks like and i think at this time i'd had you know i i believe this was after the boyfriend that looked like uh wesley from a princess bride and and he later like the same day he broke up with me he ended up dating my ex or my uh so-called best friend like an hour later so that's fun um <laughs> and i think that Uh, so I thought at first, you know, the golden, where is it saying the thing about uh, your golden beauty, your rosy cheeks, deep blue eyes, but I don't think I was trying to go that deep within my mental capacity. I, did, I don't think I wanted to touch that. That was too painful for me. I think ultimately um, it might have been about not just camp, but some of my... Um, I had, I lived, grew up in something called the, the, um, Vineyard Club, and it we grew up on a lake, and it was a very, very country club, like, emphasis on country, especially back then, not so much now, but it was very country, very rugged, in a sense, and I had a bunch of friends, uh, a lot of them were people that came up from, they had second homes growing up, and their parents had bought it, and they lived in the city year round but then they had these second homes and then me and another friend a couple other friends we had homes there full time and this might have been touching on both camp and some of those friends because there was one that that could one of the guys that was actually my first crush ever real crush um was that sense of golden beauty your rosy cheeks deep, deep blue eyes that kind of sounds like him but i feel like it might also be about camp and missing those people and just the passage of time you know not as being a young person and that sense of security that i felt that i didn't feel at home or in school i, I didn't always feel that i was accepted within all my classmates at the time and i think i think whatever that means maybe there was a sense of normalcy I s they see me every day I see them every day we're used to each other and there's that hierarchy that's already there for whatever reason you know that starts in middle school you go from being friends in fifth grade and then all of a sudden in middle school you're you know setting up this hierarchy it's not I don't have any anger <laughs> towards these kids these kids these my classmates that I knew back then. I've worked through a lot of that. There was something early in my recovery that I had to work through a lot of that. Um, but that is just what you do. I think that's a sense of specifically in this world and in, in America and the United States, a capitalism, there is a sense of like learning about hierarchy. I mean, maybe that's why that, that book, uh, Lord of the Flies is so popular because I've never read it, but what I've heard is that sense of like the, the hierarchy and the survival of the fittest and all of that comes out. And it, it I don't know if it's a human nature thing or based on a societal thing or somehow both, but it's, it, it's somewhat normal. Um, at the time, I mean, I never had, there was a boy in our, my school, he was a little bit older than me, that did commit suicide. I didn't know really specifics of it. And he lived actually in my neighborhood. But 
I never really knew him that well. And I was pretty little. I must have been somewhere in elementary school. But for the most part, for me, I never really got um, teased. They were bad. <laughs> they would, and my classmates would even admit, like, remember, we were pretty bad. <laughs> but um, I don't think in the long, like, looking at, at the how kids are now and, and you know, the, the school shootings and everything that they have to go through, we, the bullying could stop when I went home. And I don't think I really had it. it they weren't that bad. Looking back at the time, I was pretty miserable and I was harboring that. It had pretty much stopped by the time I got to freshman, fifth grade, whatever, or fifth grade, sophomore year, whatever. But I had felt, but I felt like, um, uh, I think I still had a lot of anger and uncertainty and instability, probably, you know, from all aspects of my life, not just them. Why am I, I'm just really all over the place today. So I looked at these people that I knew outside of school that didn't see me every day, didn't really know what was going on, but I looked at them as a sense of there was stability because they gave me that unconditional love and acceptance, specifically camp, but also the, the DC people. Uh, we're going to read a few more. It's a long one today. It began, now we are free from daily life, to a vast world with a ray of possibilities. The days were challenging and kept us occupied, working hand in hand for the well-being of the children. We're working hand in hand. <laughs> we're just going to walk down the street holding hands and caring for these kids. It's a little difficult to work hand in hand. I don't have my hands. Can I let go? Um, <laughs> troubles really filled us decisions had to be made we had to be in charge that we were free to recreate ourselves to experiment to love to learn we dared ourselves to the uttermost of our of limits did things we've never done before then in a flash it was over we boarded the bus together and as soon as we reached our destination went our separate ways promising to meet again in the off season so we left and returned to reality the reality of our lives before but as we left we realized that coming home was the greatest challenge of all for me i don't know about the, for the others i think you know a lot of them had pretty healthy situations back in the real world but i know for me i had a lot of insecurities that i wasn't dealing with whether it was at school or home or wherever and i had to but I'm glad that I had that sense of safety. I was going to go and read more, but it's already almost at 40 minutes. And I think that's a lot. I think that there was a lot that was discussed today. And I think that it would be good to kind of allow that to marinate a little for myself and for you. If you out there taking all this in. So thank you for watching. If you like it, you know, please like, please hit the thumbs up. Even if you don't like it that's a reaction. I welcome that. Comment below whatever you want to say, you know, once again about the squirrels. Do you have any thoughts about that or how to get rid of them? They're in the walls. It's slowly, it's getting better. And um, anything else you want to add? Thank you. And I will see you next.
From strength to strength you've lifted me And I close my eyes And you can still my heart And I call out your name Cause you always know You always know where to find Stand on a mountain top, and I could speak your name.